and welcome back to the Rural Tourism and Sustainable Development Conference. Now we've come to our next session, Empowering Local Communities for Sustainable Tourism Development. And with that, moderating today's session is the Special Advisor for Sustainability and Social Responsibility from the Pacific Asia Travel Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Graham Harper. Over to you, Graham. Paul, thank you. And thank you very much for having us with, with you today. It's a pleasure to be joining this uh, important event. And to everyone who is participating, I would like to say welcome. Welcome to our session. Today, we are discussing the role of rural tourism development to ensure a fairer distribution of the benefit of tourism through job creation, infrastructure development, social inclusion, and the empowerment of traditionally disadvantaged groups. This obviously is a huge task and at first can appear daunting. It can also be somewhat confusing at first glance for it appears that the goals of rural tourism are complementary to community-based tourism development. Today, our panel wants to explore these issues and provide insights. Our ultimate goal is to understand how tourism, the tourism industry can lead to better economic growth, thus raising the standard of living for rural communities. We believe this is possible by public and private sectors working together to empower local communities for sustainable tourism development and economic prosperity across the Asia Pacific region. For today's panel, I'm pleased to introduce the guests that are joining with me and as I introduce them, I would like them to turn on their cameras so that we can go into our introductions. The first is Ms. Wanvipa Panumat, who is the Director of the Office of Community-Based Tourism for the Designated Areas for Sustainable Tourism Development, or DASTA, from Thailand. Welcome, Wanvipa. Next, from Malaysia, we have Ms. Norida Othman, who is the general manager of the Sabah Tourism Board. And finally, joining us is Professor Hankwin Kui, the distinguished professor and dean of the College of Tourism and Service Management of Nankai University. Please. Now, I think that what we'd like to do to kick off our discussion is to be able to ask each of our panelists to give a brief introduction of themselves and what they see as both the challenges and also the opportunities for successful rural tourism development. Now, let's start in with Thailand. Uh, Ms. Wan Vipa, please, if we could start with you. Would you be able to give some introduction to your work with DASTA and the insights that provides for the challenges and opportunities to succeed for rural tourism development? Thank you, Graham. Thank you so much for having me. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Manwipa Panumat, and as Graham kindly introduced me, I am the Director of Community-Based Tourism Development Office at DASTA Thailand. Um, so basically my work um, at DASTA is to um, making sure that the community, the local community is getting the benefit from tourism development. And that way, what we use is that we use community-based tourism as the approach to work with the local communities. And um, since I have been working with DASTA for about 10 years, I can see the change of the trends and the opportunity that 
the rural tourism and the community based tourism is um, is is today. As you know, after COVID nineteen, people are looking for um, travel further and deeper and to more um, unique places and to do the um, like memorable activity with the authenticity in the areas. So these are the opportunity that I think the tourism can be um, one of the tools for community-based tourism and for sustainable um, rural development as well. And one of the insight that I have learned during the time that I'm working with the local communities around Thailand is that um, for them to be successful, of course, that there should be focusing on participatory process. Like as a government, we work to make sure that the local community feels the ownership and be empowered by the capacity building programs and to get them involved in all the process of development. And another key success factor is that you need to make sure that the benefit sharing to the local community is very clear and very fair to them because if they see the benefit of getting involved in tourism development, then they will participate and they will feel the ownership and they will feel proud of presenting themselves through the rural tourism. Thank you, Graham. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And, you know, extremely interesting. And I, I think what really caught my ear there was, you know, number one, talking about the participatory approach. Um, by working with the local communities to ensure that sort of sharing of benefits. And I mean, ultimately, that's all leading to that empowerment, which is really what we're here talking about today. So wonderful, great introduction and a great way to kick it off. But now let's move on to our next panelist, to Ms. Norida. And Perhaps you could give some insights into what you were doing with the Saba Tourism Board and you know, some of those opportunities and challenges that we could be faced with. Um, hi, Graham, thank you. Um, my name is Norita and I am the General Manager of Saba Tourism Board. We have recently renamed it to CEO. Um, and we, are, we have been involved in promoting rural tourism since, uh, for a long time, but we have really focused on it in 2014. Uh, so since then, um, in 2017, when we have sort of established the rural tourism uh, among the local communities, we have actually embarked on four pilot projects in four different districts. And the first step was actually to, like uh, uh, Madam Warbe Paz has said, uh, it's the ownership. Yeah, creating the ownership, feeling that you know they own the the product and they are responsible for the products uh, itself, and also for them to be able to participate in the development of rural tourism. On, on the Sabah context, we have started with making sure that all the districts, all the twenty six districts in Sabah, have actually established a rural tourism association. So that each district are able to do it more on a regulatory basis, you know, more on a, uh, uh, we've set up a framework for them. And as you know, um, we want to achieve by 2025, we would like to achieve the ASEAN uh, community-based tourism standards for all our rural tourism products. So this is to, uh, a way forward, to look forward. And uh, before COVID, in 2019, we have been very, very, um, uh, very active in stimulating the interests of the rural community, and every districts are already very excited in creating and also identifying their own tourism products. There are, of course, challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenge is perhaps infrastructure, the road going into the rural areas. Um, so we are looking into it that, so our Ministry of Tourism is not working on a silo mode. We are working together hand in hand with other ministries, the likes of Ministry of Infrastructure, as well as Ministry of Local Government and uh, Rural uh, 
development ministry. So in this way, we are able to synergize our effort in developing rural tourism as well as making sure that everyone has that feeling of ownership and responsibility. Wow, fantastic. And, you know, I, I couldn't agree more for the need to be looking at things such as the infrastructure and, you know, to not be working in that silo, as you mentioned, but to be working cross ministerial to be able to integrate what you're doing together with, for example, the Ministry of Infrastructure. Wonderful, and would love to hear more about those four pilot projects that you know, you've already done and how that's leading into every district across the uh, region, your area. Thank you. And with that, we'd like to move on to Professor Han Quinn and to kind of understand the, the Chinese focus on the possibilities with rural tourism. Professor, please, some of the opportunities and challenges as you see them. Thank you very much, Grant, for having me. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm a, a professor and o, uh, of international tourism. I often share with all my colleagues and students and friends that I have been uh, in the tourism field for probably more than 30 years. I know very little about anything else, but a little bit about tourism. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, well, speaking from, I guess I came from academic world probably I'll just share with you what I see uh, rural tourism. I think probably, first of all, we need to have a clear understanding what the rural tourism is, what is the conceptual issues, uh, what do we mean by the rural tourism? It can be quite helpful for us to understand the concept first, and then there are different stakeholders involved in developing the rural tourism, ranging from local residents, and also the local government, and also, of course, the, uh, the operators. And everyone comes from different backgrounds. So how can we bring all the stakeholders together to develop a sustainable and well-balanced rural tourism? I think that's how we should uh, understand uh, uh, rural tourism, uh, first of all. Secondly, I believe that uh, the rural tourism also uh, is very much uh, in China's case, uh, it's a policy driven. So we uh, need to pay, pay attention to what are the national policies. For example, recently we're talking about uh, uh, how rural tourism can be used as part of the revitalization process for the rural communities to help them and to uh, have a better uh, uh, development from local community point of view. And also a lot of research and uh, uh, has been done in this area, and particularly for those uh, less developed areas. A lot of uh, tourists are also interested in uh, going into there. I think uh, probably we need to uh, consider from policy point of view, from stakeholders point of view, and also uh, from tourist point of view and also local community. It is uh, well balanced. Uh, development. That's something I think we need to uh, pay attention. And also, uh, in addition to that, I think uh, the sustainability issue is also important. In the tourism field, there are a lot of research has been done regarding tourism sustainability. But what about rural tourism sustainability? Okay, so if we uh, help the local community to develop a rural tourism, is it going to be sustainable? So all these issues probably need to be uh, considered. And also uh, in terms of rural tourism, there will be a lot of local resources uh, will be used. How can we balance that usage uh, in terms of long-term development? I think these issues need to be well think through an early stage of the development from all stakeholders' point of view. And finally, I think I would like to share technology also have a lot of impact on the tourism development in China as a whole. So how the rural tourism development can take the full advantage of the technology advancement to support the local community to have a well-balanced rural tourism with a good tourist experience and also taking the local interest 
into consideration in order to be uh, uh, sustainable and long-term development for all. I think those are the issues probably I can share with you uh, from uh, research, from policy, from multi-stakeholders. It is everyone's business to responsibly developing the rural tourism as a whole. Thank you. Yeah, yeah wonderful. And I, I, I love how you started off with sort of the multi-stakeholder approach. And, you know, then at the very end, finishing with how, you know, it's everyone's role within this. Um, but also just, you know, how, how to be able to work with those uh, quite remote areas, also a very, very important part of the overall work. So with that, let's, let, let's move on to another question. And Vipa, I'll go back to you, because I know that DASTA, just in the work with, you know, community-based tourism, but, you know, moving more and more into the rural tourism, um, you have developed criteria um, from the GSTC, Global Sustainable Tourism Council um, standards on how to be able to manage tourism. And I wonder if you could explain how this could possibly be a tool that could be used um, for the destination management and for rural tourism. Uh, actually, um, at DASTA, we work with GSTC, the Global Sustainable Tourism Council, um, to use GSTC as the main guidelines for um, sustainable tourism development in every level of development. So basically, in the destination level, we use the GSTCD, like GSTC for destination, um, to be like an um, umbrella the big umbrella for planning for each destination. And we also develop our own um, guideline called Sustainable Tourism Management Standards, which is to empower the local government um, to be the tools for them when the, when the local government needs to work with different stakeholders in the destination. We treat the local government as a um, destination management organization. So basically they should learn how to um, plan or how to implement um, in align with the GSTC uh, criteria. And we also develop the CBT Thailand standard, the community-based tourism Thailand standard um, as a, in align with GSTC as well to plan the capacity building program and to be the guideline for CBT development in, uh, for now, we have more than 160 local communities around Thailand that uh, in the process of develop according to this criteria. So basically this, this, this GSTC, this CBT Thailand um, standard and um, all the GSTC guidelines that we use, we see the benefit of using it as, first of all, we use it as a um, evaluation tools when we start to work with each communities or each destination, we use this guideline to as a checklist to see what is missing, what are the um, strain points and this kind of things. And we also use it as a planning tools so that what is missing, we put it in like a capacity building program for each destination. And then we also have um, use it to be as a monitoring um, two as well. So basically, whatever we develop in each local communities, we will invite other stakeholders like the private sector, the academics, the um, governmental agencies to, to learn about GSTC and then monitor or evaluate the capacity of each community-based tourism project that we work as well so that we can continue to um, develop them according to GSTC. So these are the things that um, the process that we are working with each destination that we um, do in Thailand. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, you've been working a lot with the GSTC, but, you know, there are other standards. And, you know, if we look around, you know, well, I mean, just previously in her, her answer before, Norida was talking about the ASEAN standards and how they're trying to get every district, you know, within their region to be able to adhere to those standards. 
So how, I mean, if you were talking to one of your colleagues, you know, maybe from another country, another destination, and, you know, they were kind of wondering which standard should they be looking at, what advice would you give? And, you know, how can they best identify the standards that they should be using? Um, actually, from my um, experience of using GSTC, and actually in Thailand, we we also have some other communities that has been award uh, CNCBT standard already. We can see the linkage um, to each other. So basically every standard that we are using is um, aligned with GSTC. So, but what I have as an advice is that GSTC is a big umbrella. Um, it's like a global guideline, but you need to really adapt it into the context of each um, nations or each countries because the thing is that when Thailand we use we we bring the GSTC to Thailand we need to adapt a little bit as well for example GSTC have four dimensions um, like the sustainable tourism management they have the economic sustainability and um, social and cultural sustainability and environmental sustainability but when we implement it in Thailand and we work with private sector as well. We add another two dimensions to it, which is the health and safety issues. And another thing is that we add um, the linkage, like how we can link the local communities to the tourism supply chain. So these are another two dimensions that we add to the GSTC and develop it to be CBT Thailand standards. And then we use it and we send it to the GSCC and say that, okay, please have a look whether it's aligned. And then the GSCC endorse this standard to be like a Thailand context standard. So my suggestion is that don't just bring everything and then implement it in each destination because you need to really see the cultural context or the social context in each country as well. Yeah, fantastic. And, you know, what I really heard there was the adapt, you know, every place is different. Every destination is different. One size does not fit all. So we always have to be looking for how we adapt it to that local context. And, you know, that's probably one of the true underlying principles of rural tourism is that, you know, we do need to adapt because every community is going to be unique in their own way. So Norida, let's let's move over to you because you know in the Sabah Tourism Board, you know your mission is to be able to form smart partnerships with tourism stakeholders. You alluded to that before with about you know the Ministry of Infrastructure, and you know that's to adopting and complying with best industry practices in order to achieve that sustainable economic development and environmental integrity. I mean, you've set yourself a very you know, high, strong mission. So how has rural tourism played a role in allowing you to achieve this mission? Well, Graham, um, just like what uh, one Vipa has said, you know, it's incorporating other elements into the context of different areas. Uh, as you know, we are so rich in cultural diversity. That's the most important thing that we are able to uh, contain and preserve our culture, our environment, and also at the same time, elevate that social economic, all our community. I mean, one of the reasons that we have established rural tourism and CBT practices is because we want to make sure that tourism is not just confined to the urban areas, but it is also spilled over to all the rural areas so that they don't have to travel far earn money for tour in tourism, but they can actually stay within their community and earn tourism dollar too. So for us, um, rural tourism has actually helped us see how rich and how, how blessed we are basically in terms of culture, in terms of nature, you know? and at the same time, it will help us preserve our environment, yeah? the rivers, the mountains, if there is a way and there is a purpose in every thing that we do, we are able to also conserve you know, what's around us. And I think uh, rural tourism has actually allowed and opened the eyes of our local community 
that they don't just have to work in five-star resorts, but they can also stay within their community and earn tourism dollar, but at the same time, preserving their culture, making sure that nature will remain as it is for the next generation. I think for us, that's very important, not just in terms of tourism dollar, but it is sustainability. You know, we won't leave our nature as pristine as it can be to our next generation. Not just for today, we don't want to earn the money today, but we want to make sure that our grandchildren will be able to appreciate their nature, you know, the blessing that we are, we are given, and also earn income through that in a sustainable way. Hence why we want to make sure that by 2025, all our rural tourism products adhere to some sort of standard. We're not as lucky as Thailand. They have all the standards all laid out. We are learning. But we'd like to learn from all the good practices, all the best practices, yeah? Um, and, and to make sure that we don't make mistakes or rather we minimize the mistakes the human can make. Uh, when, you know, when, the, when you see dollars, dollars, you may be able to make mistakes. So we, let's minimize that through learning, through understanding what rural tourism is all about make sure that it incorporates into our daily lives and appreciate our culture, nature, and don't stray too far. Yeah, I think that's, that's the best for the rural tourism. Thanks. Yeah, wonderful. And I mean, you, you really, really highlight the natural beauty and diverse wildlife, which of course, Sapa is so well known for. I mean, it is such a precious resource. And, you know, how you say it's not just for today, but, you know, it is also for those future generations. Now, can you maybe just, just elaborate a little bit more on maybe some of the ways that you can ensure that rural tur tourism does not threaten those precious resources? Can you give us any kind of examples of maybe how we can be following your lead here? Um, we always say that, Let's share the stories behind our rural tourism. You know, in Sabah, we are also known as to have the, the Tagal system. Tagal system is where they actually conserve certain parts of the river. They do not harvest the fish certain uh, time of the year, you know, or, or rather throughout the year, they do not harvest the fish, only doing it at certain time of the year. So this is one of the system that, you know, uh, age old uh, a system that is still practiced today. Um, also, another another method is actually we are an aspiring global geopark. Um, the 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 area near our mountain, Mount Kinabalu and Kinabalu Park, is is, is an aspiring global geopark, and we hope we'll be able to uh, achieve that this year. And within that global geopark, the proposed global geopark, we have three main districts. Kota Belud, Ranau, as well as Kota Marudu. And these three areas have very high potential in terms of rural community, uh, community-based tourism. So being within that uh, um, spectrum of conservation area, we are also able to, to lay down the rules and regulations on what not to do and what to do. Uh, hence, you know, achieving the sustain sustainability. Yeah, I think uh, that's very important for us. Yeah, fantastic. And I, I really get that, you know, number one, you're talking about really building on those traditional uh, standards, traditional ways of doing things, you know, with the no fishing in the rivers, but also through your product development, you know, the geo reserve, etc. So wonderful examples. Thank you very much. And Professor Han Quinn, um, perhaps we could move over to you. And, you know, throughout your, especially in your introduction, you know, we're highlighting this, but throughout your distinguished career, you have explored and researched many aspects of the tourism industry. And I'm most interested in how you perceive the role of tourism behavior in rural development. Particularly, how can the more affluent urban travelers, you know, their expectations of comfort how can that be met in rural situations? Thank you very much. That's a very interesting and uh, uh, question for me to share with all of you. Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, rural tourism is a multi-stakeholder business. Uh, probably I can share with you a little bit about the China situation. Uh, I believe that the, the rural tourism in China 
is a big topic. It, it really has a lot of potential for development. From government point of view, I guess they have a very important role to play in terms of infrastructure investment development, because as you can all appreciate that, China is a huge country. Road is the most important. So I believe that uh, uh, from multi-stick point of view, everyone has an important role to play before we move into the tourist side. So for the rural tourism to be developed in the long run, sustainably from cultural, social, environmental, host and guest relationship point of view, I believe government has an important role to play to build a grand infrastructure to support the development. That's the first and the foremost important issue, uh, which Chinese government has been doing very well. As you can see, our the road system, and our railways, our high-speed train, you name it. So <laughs> they are uh, uh, one of the best, I can say. And secondly, I believe, as uh, uh, our panelists shared with all of us, I believe the standard, the certification at the global level is also very, very important to have a standardized uh, sustainable development practices sharing among different uh, communities. So no matter it is uh, uh, probably our Thailand friends developed a GSTC in which some of China destinations have joined. I did my homework before I came. And I guess as uh, Graham mentioned earlier, any standard helps for the industry to be advanced. So I guess that's also uh, is a role to be played by the government monitoring and for the uh, any kind of uh, NGOs and the committees, the councils, all have an important role to play. As I said, tourism is a very complicated multi-stakeholders business. And then finally coming to a uh, grand point from tourist point of view, when we as the tourists going to the uh, rural areas, we like to join the local community by talking to the people, understand their culture. I have some students going to the community doing a lot of projects. They just love the environment. But as you can see that, of course, rural areas life will be very different from the city. So we need to lower our expectation first. You are coming to the countryside, countryside to experience different type of uh, uh, experience. But having said that, it doesn't mean that they, they, they can uh, sacrifice the quality experience. When you are tourists, no matter where you go, you do have expectations. I think uh, uh, the rural areas have an important role to play to advance their services, to provide positive experience. Eventually, you can bring them back to your business. I have been to some of the rural uh, uh, area tourism sites. I think they have been doing very well, but some of them, uh, of course, need a lot of improvement. They are different types of, just like hotels, right? When you are walking into a five-star hotel, you would imagine yourself to be in a spoiled by the best services in the world. Whereas when you go into a less developed areas, you would experience something very local. So depend on the tourist have to adjust the expectations where the local host have to do a good job, if I may say. So it's really a balance uh, overall uh, thing we need to be fully aware of. I hope I answer your question, Grant. Yes, you did perfectly. And thank you very much because, you know, those traveler expectations are really important. And I just want to kind of check a little bit more with that is, you know, how can that be accommodated through improved tourism and planning regulations? I mean, can you give us any examples of those? You mean, can, can you say that again? Sorry. For the traveler expectations, can they be accommodated through, you know, maybe the improvement of tourism planning and regulations? Well, I guess from planning and regulations point of view, if you set different standard, the different type of destinations, just like a hotel or other grading system, then people will know in advance, I'm walking into a super five-star hotel or five-star resort or five-star rural tourism destinations, I would have very different expectations. Whereas if I walk into a probably different rate grading system, uh, the place, that I would have low expectation. Probably from rural tourism development point of view, 
if you may say so, planning point of view, we would communicate that standard well in the ones to the customers. In that way, they know what to expect when they are actually getting there. Thank you. Wonderful, and thank you very much. And I'd like just to open up a question to all of you, and this is sort of a, a spur of the moment question for you, but it wasn't that long ago. You know, think back two years ago when we would be talking about over-tourism. In today's world, we're not. In today's world, we've gone from over-tourism to zero-tourism, and with the pandemic, we just have to deal with that. But, you know, thinking back to that sort of over-tourism dilemma that we were facing, there was a lot of talk about the product diversification. And I'd just like to get your quick insights into how we can be using rural tourism and the product development with rural tourism to assist with the overall diversification of economic benefits and tourism flows. So quick, it's a big question, but quick answers. Juan Vipa, let's start with you. Um, I think one, one of the benefit of having rural tourism is to, um, of course, to disperse um, the tourists from the overcrowded areas. But um, to successfully do that, I think it has to be the elements of um, the readiness of the secondary destination as well, like the rural area. Um, as um, Noreda had mentioned that the infrastructure needs to be ready and one of the, one of the um, important thing is that the local communities or the rural communities need to be understand about what are the pros and cons of tourism as well. They need to equip with the tools and the mindset of how to sustainably manage tourism. Because when the tourist comes, from the big city with the expectation that the professor mentioned, they need to deal with that kind of expectation and give the memorable experience as well to be successfully um, um, do that. Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Norida? Well, um, for Saba, our theme for rural tourism is explore, experience, and you enjoy. So you are exploring the rural areas, basically. Uh, like what uh, you know, uh, my colleague from Thailand says, you have the, the tourism stakeholders have to be ready. They have to know what is expected of them. And uh, especially now with the new norm and all that, you know, uh, clean and safe protocols has to be in place. Um, in terms of carrying capacity, it must also be looked at. Uh, before COVID, we our islands were uh, filled to the brim, you know, and now we have a carrying capacity. You know, we do not allow um, more than a hundred uh, hundred person, hundred visitors per day during this tight situation. Um, it may improve later on, but we we see that we are able to. Um, be more prepared, yeah. And I think uh, for us, whose international borders are closed uh, until today, uh, for the next perhaps six to one year, we six months to one year, we will be depending on domestic tourism. Hence, we are our, our locals will be moving around to actually experience and explore and enjoy our rural tourism. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And that's, you know, a good, a good comment that, you know, we are focusing on that domestic tourism at this point, an important strategy at this point in time. Professor, yourself on the diversification of economic benefits and tourism flows? Yes, thank you very much. I think our panelists uh, has mentioned quite a good few good points, especially uh, just on this topic of domestic tourism probably is most relevant for China and also very relevant to our topic today on rural tourism because we'll need more space 
with social distance and for the benefit of everyone's health. I believe rural tourism is, uh, will have a very important role to play for China's case because China is a huge country, probably in this uh, current situation with limited travel allowed globally, probably developing domestic tourism would provide our rural tourism uh, stakeholders and operators a lot of opportunities. At the same time, probably uh, people are paying more attention to the health issues and they love the fresh air and the countryside life. So I certainly see the bright future for the rural tourism for all of us to experience more in the more remote areas, if I may say so. Thank you. Yes, and I, I love that bright future. And with that, with that, you know, talking about the bright future, my last question to each of you is about the future. Now, let's imagine it's now September 2026, five years in the future. The world has finally recovered from the COVID pandemic and international tourism is back. What do you think our industry has learned and how will we be better prepared for the next great event? So Wanvipa, once again, let's start with you. And what do you think our industry has learned and how will we be better prepared for the next great crisis, please? I think one of the lessons that we have learned during this crisis is that we cannot overlook about the risk management in the local area as well. Because um, with DASTA, we always say to the local communities that we're working with that you shouldn't um, change your main op occupation and to just use tourism as you know the single income you know, that's too risky and it proved that with this crisis it, it's, it proved that tourism is very risky indeed and we need to you know like um, manage it in a very careful um, not over dependent on tourism yeah, and or not over dependent on specific market. Yeah. So this kind of things that I've learned and another thing that I've learned during this crisis is that networking is very important. And that like for the local communities or for the rural community, especially to outreach yourself and link with other stakeholders or other communities is very important. Because the thing is that without the tourism now, at least you have friends around the countries that you know, like support each other in terms of you know, agricultural products or um, you know, like fishery or something like that. You know, at least you have someone to give you the support and to share the experience and to overcome this crisis together. And in time, also, in, yeah. In times of crisis, it's always good to have the friends. Yes, 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 indeed. And it's not only about the friends of other local communities, but the friends from the private sector as well. You know, the tour operator, the hotels that you're used to working with, they are in the same crisis with you. So at least you need to hold hands, you know, and yes, going yes. strong together. Yeah. Yes. So these are the things that I think will help well, you sustain in the long term. Yeah. And I like that risk management. It's very, you know, you got to look at the risks involved with the tourism and the local communities have to know that. But I love that developing friends and holding the hands. Norida, over to you. What do you think some of the main lessons learned? Never put your eggs in one basket, they say. <laughs> um, but it is important for us, I think, for, uh, to you know, everyone talks about resilience. Uh, but most of all, I feel um, solidarity and understanding is very important in terms of crisis. I like that holding hands. We've been holding each other's hands here in Sabah. No matter who you are, like whether you're a hotelier, whether you're tour operators, you are government officers, um, we need the understanding, we need that solidarity, we have to be solid uh, as a group, as an entity, 
so that we are able to move forward and 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 survive through this uh, together. Yeah, this will pass. They say. This will pass. Yeah. yeah, moving moving forward through the solidarity and that we can overcome these crises. And I think that's I think that's all part of just you know the understanding of the resilience that we all really do have. And professor, for yourself, a final word. Thank you. I agree with all of you. So we should support each other. We are in a very global uh, uh, oriented business, tourism and travel. We're all connected one way or the other. I often call we're hyperlinked. We're only one email away, one message away. So that's, I all totally agree. And also it is important to be fully aware about crisis management. During that process, I believe communication is the most important to internally and externally. And I also like to add one more point is that uh, probably from now until probably even shorter than five years, uh, we will be able to travel, but we probably take a full advantage of the time we have at the moment, at least for a year or so. <laughs> I wouldn't see us uh, can actually physically see each other to revisit and re -see, re go back to what our business is all about to see how we can develop better human talent how we can gain more support for our industry. And then uh, when the time is right, we are all ready to fly when the sky is open. And uh, I wish all we can all see each other very soon in the near future. I truly believe people have short memories. We'll forget all about all these difficulties we have experienced and we'll be very happy to see each other eventually. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you to all three of the panelists. Um, I, I love how you all finished with your final comments with very actually inspiring, optimistic, even though we're in the midst of, you know, one of the greatest events that has ever hit tourism, we can see some light at the end of the tunnel and we can see that optimism there. Um, this brings us to the end of today's discussion in the role of rural tourism development. And, you know, really what we've been talking about is how can we ensure a fair distribution of the benefits of tourism? And, you know, that job creation, infrastructure development, social inclusion, and, you know, the empowerment. And that's all, these have all been words and topics that have been raised by our panelists today. So once again, I would like to thank our panel for their insights and shared wisdom to help us understand how our tourism industries can lead to better economic growth and thus raising the standard of living for rural communities by the public and private sectors, by working together to empower local communities for sustainable tourism development and economic prosperity across the Asia Pacific region. As we all said, holding hands as we move forward. With that, thank you very much, everyone. And Paul, we'll be turning back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, you have to unmute. Sorry, uh, that, that's like the quote of the year, right? So thank you very much, Grant, for doing an excellent job of moderating the session. And thank you to all of our panelists for taking the time out of their busy schedules for joining us for today's conference. With that, I'll let you guys go while I do uh, the next uh, transition to our next session. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you. So with that, we've just heard of the session on empowering local communities for sustainable tourism development. And as we move to our next session, please sit back, relax, and enjoy this promotional video from the town of World Rural Tourism. Enjoy.